Emmanuel Institute actually changed my life forever. I, I was active in ministry and have been for a number of years, but when I left the Emmanuel Institute, it sort of lifted that spiritual game for me. Um, I learned how to do Bible studies, how to handle objections, how to um, give Evangelism 101 courses at our church, which I've implied and, and put into practice. Just all kinds of things, door knocking. We've, we learn all sorts of stuff. For anybody who's nervous or feels awkward about witnessing or sharing the truth, uh, Emmanuel opens up all those doors for you and takes away pretty much all that pressure. Just the spiritual excellence, the desire to save souls and to work and train people, it was really beneficial. I think it's one word, two letters. If we do this, we'll grow spiritually, we'll grow together closer as a church, and that word is go. Our next Emmanuel Institute training intensive is coming up September 10 through 16. If you want to deepen your own walk with Christ, learn how to share your faith more effectively, and help grow your local church, make plans now to attend. Registration is limited, so visit michigansspm.org today. I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're still continuing our study of the book of Ephesians right now. We're on the 10th lesson today. Back in the office again. Back Those in the office again. Those who watched last week saw our little camp meeting special. It was nice. My birthday. Happy birthday We're to Mark past Howard. past that now. Well, now you're just another year older. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but it was so great to be at camp let's meeting. Let's move together. on. <laughs> well, I did say, though, it was great to be camp. And I think we should do that again. It was nice to have the audience there. and We could kind of walk through things together mm -hmm. and maybe give people a behind-the-scenes look at how all of this comes together. Yeah, it was very impressive. It's quite impressive. <laughs> but here we are on Lesson 10 of our Ephesians Quarter. Uh, this week, husbands and wives together at the cross. So this, of course, is diving into Ephesians chapter 5, the second half there, when it applies uh, some of the things he'd been saying previously to the relationship of marriage, and we're going to, well, my little introduction is, this week we explore Paul's counsel to husbands and wives in mm -hmm. Ephesians 5. There it is. So, pretty straightforward. Let's do that. Let us do that. If you would, please. Pray? Yes, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit of truth to give us understanding. We, pray, we want to pray a special prayer, Lord, especially for our Sabbath school teachers who are preparing this lesson, that it may be for the edification of your people. I pray that you would bless our time together here for the upbuilding of the kingdom of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, I noticed in our memory verse text this week, it starts with, Husbands, love your wives. And that's the second part of the marriage council. But, of course, it starts mm -hmm. in verse 22 with, Wives, submit your own mm. to your own husbands. And so there is this husband and wife dynamic we're going to be taking a look at. But before we dive into the specifics, let's get a overview of three yeah, main let's hear talking, talking points. points this week. Number we one, go. true Christianity involves submission. That's going to come from Sabbath afternoon and Sunday, but there's a bigger principle than just applies to husbands and wives. Sure. It's to all of us. Next, we have talking point number two. Like the Godhead, marriage is complementary. So there's different roles Godhead, and different functions. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we kind of touch on that one. And finally, talking point number three, marriage represents Christ and his church. Okay. That's going to be Monday and Tuesday, and kind of a theme that's woven through, of course, all of these passages. You're going to see that repeated. All right, fantastic. But so, let's go back to, yeah, talk talking point number, point number one. True Christianity involves submission. Well, if we look at our passage, you would think that you would start this passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, where mm -hmm. it talks, wives, submit your own husbands, and in verse 25, husbands, love your wives. But our section of study begins actually verse 21. Why don't you read that to us? For us. Yes, and from last uh, our last study together, submitting to one another in the fear of God, uh, it was interesting in the last lesson it drew this in, which I don't think is improper, mm -hmm. to a corporate setting. Yes. Um, you know, submitting to one another and singing hymns to one another and this kind of thing. But very clearly, he's applying this as he goes forward. This is not the congregation. Right. <laughs> this is the husband and the wife. Well, and that seems to be, like you said, 
somehow it was in last week's lesson and it can be in this week's lesson, like it's a transition type of statement that kind of encompasses a broader theme that he yes. then applies more specifically. Well, I partially say that because, you know, your talking point is true Christianity involves submission, which is not something that most, it's not easy for the carnal nature to submit. No. And so to have, you know, oh, well, it's only in the corporate setting. <laughs> you know, coming away. Nope. It's going to be submission it's, across the board. Yeah, well, so. it, it's, I don't know which would be easier, submit to one another generically or specifically to husbands and wives, but there is this spirit of selflessness that it has a deference for others that's always seen. In, for instance... Well, I'm, I'm just thinking in church, I guess, in church I, I have my place and I'm going to go, it's about me. Yeah, know? that's right. No, it's the Versus, whole life. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's kind of what I wanted to pick up on, because if you notice at verse 21, where they start our section <clears throat> of scripture this week, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Well, right. that's... That's not a sentence. That's mm -hmm. a sentence fragment. It's a clause, right. right? We'll go back to verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God. That's also not a sentence. That's right. It starts way back and, for instance. <laughs> when you're I, reading Paul, it's like exactly. it's back in chapter 2. <laughs> now, I believe it's, it's it starts in verse 18, if I'm not mistaken, yep. where it says, do not be drunk with wine. Uh, but he says, but be filled with the Spirit, mm -hmm. speaking to one another. And then it invokes the yes. one anotherness. So the you individually being filled with the Spirit is automatically going to have changes or, or uh, effect on your relationships right. to one another. So it's, tr it's transitioning from the you be spiritual with God and filled with the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, and then automatically how you deal with one another, and you kind of encapsulate that submitting to one another yeah. as in the fear of God. Uh, in the well, fear I think of where you're God. going to has to do, you know, we can, you know, being filled with the Spirit sometimes it can be used very uh, generically. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, just be spiritual. But I believe he's speaking here very specifically about the Holy Spirit and his role connected with the Godhead. I think yes. that's... Yes, well, absolutely. Well, if you notice, interestingly enough, right because after it says... Does, yeah. Well, in verse 18, it tells us to be filled with the Spirit, which is good counsel, of course. Mm -hmm. But then in verse 20, we should give thanks to God the Father, mm -hmm. in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So interestingly, in the verses immediately preceding the submit to one another counsel, yes. there's the the inference or the, inf the uh, what's the word, invoking yes. of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right. in different roles. And so it's as, as though he's taking the Godhead and making it a model for human relationships. Right? Each has their distinct role, but they're supposed to complement one another and each has this spirit of, well, of course they have a spirit of Christ-like or God-like. Yeah. Everything they do is God-like, yeah, right? Yeah, we know about that. But you see, in, if you were to study this out, you know, you'd see how the Father, well, I don't want to get too far into that yes. right now, but we're getting to regardless, that. one of the truest evidences of being filled with the spirit of a converted mm -hmm. life is that deference for others, a spirit of let others increase that I right. can decrease, Right. And you see this in Paul's writing over and over right here in Philippians. He talked, I mean, Ephesians, in Philippians, of course. Submission is an attribute of selflessness, not selfishness. Right. And the carnal heart is enmity against God. It yeah. is inherently incapable of selflessness. So if there's any good in us, it's coming from a power outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? In fact, I put this in the notes. It wasn't in the lesson, but I thought it was important. Service to others is the key distinction between the saved and the lost. This is Matthew chapter 25 when he comes to separate the sheep mm -hmm. from the goats. It's the ones who actually did good for others that get the reward. Like there is a, if, if time would permit, mm -hmm. Sister White talks about this circuit of beneficence that mm -hmm. everything in God's kingdom takes for the purpose of giving to someone else. There's a, an mm -hmm. unbroken circuit, right? And the selfish heart shorts that circuit. And God's plan is to repair that circuit of beneficence mm. and convert each soul to the selfless character of God himself. So, if that, be, if that is the case, which it is, then we would see evidence in the Godhead itself of the very character we're supposed to reflect. So, I made a little point here that God's triune nature is the model for Christian submission where each member serves a unique, necessary, and complementary role. If you were to take out, for instance which of course would be impossible, but if you take out the Holy Spirit from the Godhead, it would be an incomplete picture. But that's not to say that the Holy Spirit's the only one that makes the whole thing. Each one has to have each other 
in order for the Godhead to function. Right. And the Father plays a distinct role as the administrator and overseer. The, fa- the Son executes the will. The, the Spirit inhabits mm-hmm. and, and, and you know, dwells within the created beings and moves in ways we don't understand. So each one somehow is equally God. Each one has their own personality and identity, but each one has a complementary role within that working relationship. And it's little... It's little question in my mind why that would make such a good model for human relationships, particularly as we get into marriage, because it could be um, it could be seen that one person is the real part and the other is just the kind of help. Right. But there, there, there's a there's a symbiosis there. There's a complementary necessity to each role that we sometimes lose, lose well, sight of. Well, I mean, uh, an obvious takeaway here is that there has been a lot of discussion within the church about the divinity of the Holy Spirit or the divinity of Christ because Mm. there's this automatic assumption that if we don't have the same roles, then one is a lesser person. For example, you're the director of our department, I'm the associate. And don't you forget it. (laughs) (laughs) And so... I'm of a less value as a person than you are, right. you know, and if somebody's the CEO of a company and if somebody's or whatever, and we do this, we mm. do this a lot and we do it even with God. And so it's like, mm. well, you know, um, the, the Jesus must not be as important as right. the father is. Because, well, I mean, even the name father, oh, that right. seems like superiority kind of language. So there's a father and then there's a lesser son and then the spirit is completely Even ill-defined. though if time permitted, we would go back and show how Isaiah refers to Jesus as the everlasting father. And sure does. Know. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, let me tell you, friends, and maybe this will be a thing <laughs> in your local Sabbath school. It is very, it is very tempting not, it was very tempting for me to go down a road of yeah. Diving into the Trinity question, no. and, and 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 so you can touch on it, but don't get sidelined because stick with Ephesians and the, and the content of the text there. But clearly, the the point to draw out is that there is a Godhead in Scripture, and they are all God, and they are all equal. So right. people can contend with that, but that's that it's the very thing that we're talking about. In the same way, they contend with well, a wife must not be as important as the husband because she's supposed to submit to him. No, right. it's talking about a role distinction, which we see in the Godhead. Exactly, and that's kind of the point I was trying to draw out. That Godhead has these role distinctions, but doesn't affect their ontological actual right. reality. Same way within marriage, that Paul's going to break down: wives, here's your role; husbands, here's your role. But doesn't make one greater or less. They're just mm-hmm. the re- both necessity to make a biblical marriage be what it is. Well, I would assume in your marriage that, as in every marriage, you have to take certain roles, and there are some roles that might be considered menial that you both will share. Yeah. Sometimes you do it. Sometimes your wife does it. Whoever has time. So what does that mean? You know. Yeah. In other words, there, a role does not determine a person's importance or value. No, it does not. And it just determines what needs to be done sometimes. <laughs> you it know? does. And those roles, let, let me be clear. When we talk about marriage, we talk about marriage as a biblical concept instituted yes. by God from the very beginning of the world before there was even sin. So clearly it's part of God's ideal picture for humanity mm-hmm. that would relate to each other in this marriage bond, right? Paul, by the way, whenever he speaks about marriage, will often refer back to the creation order for his establishment of it, right? Jesus, of course, referred back to it, too, when he was talking about divorce and remarriage. He's like, have you not read that this is... And he quotes the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. So our model for marriage isn't just people will say, well, that's what Paul was thinking. No, it's what the Bible teaches, starting from creation before there was sin. (laughs) And what we find in scripture is fascinating. For instance, in Genesis chapter 1, it outlines the days of creation, Week. It doesn't even get mm-hmm. into the Sabbath. That's not till chapter two. But this is the working six days as accounted here in chapter one. And on day six, when it talks about man and woman, it says in verse 26 uh, of Genesis chapter one, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So automatically there, whatever he's about to make of humanity was intended to, to yes. reflect the image of God, right? And notice that let them have dominion over. So it's a let us make them. Now, and that's a fascinating thing. So God is not a rigid singularity, and he makes one. Mm-hmm. And then he says, well, let's add two. No, no, no. There's a something about that complementary working together that was in God's mind. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, which mm -hmm. by the way, you can't give that command to a singular person because <laughs> procreation only works with the complementary male and female parts, That's right? right? So God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. If all we had was Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, we would take away very clearly that both man and women in this marriage bond are a reflection of the image of God. So he didn't just make man, make him the image of God, give him all this mm -hmm. responsibility, and then say, oh yeah, and I'm going to make a wife. No, no, no. Both are together in the reflection of the image of God. Both were given responsibilities for multiplication, filling the earth, all those kind of things. It, it makes me think of Genesis 5, 1 and 2, where the Bible says this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them. Now, it says in the New King James, mankind in the day where mm. they were created, but it's the, in the King James, it says called their name Adam. Mm. And so, because Adam means mankind. Right. So, it's kind of an interesting spin on, on what you're saying, that they together formed mankind. Right. Even though Adam was the name of the man, yet in this particular passage, is, to your point, mankind was the two of them. Yeah, and I think it's very instructive that the Bible introduces humanity as this image of God, complementary, mm -hmm. male and female, multiply, the whole thing. Then, when you get into chapter 2, it retells the story, specifically of day 6, of the mm -hmm. making of Adam and Eve, and then it starts to articulate some of the distinctions of role between the man and the woman. Right. Right? So, it starts off with this ontological equality in the eyes of God as a reflection of his character. Then it starts to break down, and we don't have time to go through Genesis right. chapter 2 today, but clearly God made the man first, as Paul would later allude to, mm -hmm. and he gives some responsibilities, and then brings the uh, the woman to as he saw On need of. It's not good to be alone. He bring, and God performs, after setting these roles in place, the very first marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one, one flesh. So it starts with this oneness idea, it ends with the oneness idea, but in the middle it differentiates these different distinct roles. It seems that that's what Paul in Ephesians 5, as we go back to the council here, yes. is playing up on. Why don't we look at Ephesians 5? You've already got it there. Mm -hmm. Could you read uh, verses, I believe it's 22 to 20, read the 22 through 27. Sure. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, clearly, the metaphor of Christ's relation to the church is the golden thread through this council. And we're going to get to that in a third talking point. But right now, let's just stay with this, with the husbands and wives, the practical, temporal mm -hmm. uh, part here. First of all, according to Paul's instruction, um, wives should submit to their husbands. Here in, in Ephesians, it says, as the church submits to Christ, mm -hmm. right? Well, in the book of 1 Corinthians, um, the same, same instruction, similar instruction, I should say, is given. Chapter 11, verse 3, when it says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Mm. So, basically, the same way that Christ submits to the will of his Father, and the church submits to the will of Christ, mm -hmm. so the wife is supposed to submit to the will of the husband. And that sounds so countercultural. It sounds so out of harmony mm -hmm. with what we see today, which, by the way, is why I would guess they didn't make that the memory verse for this week. More than likely. More than likely. But it's no problem to say, husbands, here's your duty to the wives, but mm -hmm. there's a mutual uh, relationship here, and it starts with that submission thing. But to be clear, that submission is not unique from wives to husbands. We already saw that we're supposed to submit ourselves to one another. So it's not like... As Christians, we're all free, but those poor wives are going to have to submit now. No, all of us have a submission that we're supposed to have as a Christian. 
but specifically in the marriage relationship, there's an application for husbands and wives that's unique from other relationships. And I think that's what Paul's trying to say here. Well, unity and harmony can only exist with submission on the part of one or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 if you have a disagreement and nobody submits, you never get past a disagreement, <laughs> yeah. whether it be in the church, whether it be in the home, as you said, right. and whether it be in heaven. So mm -hmm. there is that uh, submission is, is a deferment, mm -hmm. and it's a willful deferment. Um, for the greater, you know, the plan, you know, and and the harmony of the relationship. Right. And to be clear on this point also, that does not mean that the wife has no no more thought, no more identity, right. nor she has just a passive, whatever, malleable thing. We're going to have some counsel on that in just a few minutes, where Sister White is very clear that regardless of your role in marriage, your number one loyalty is to Christ. Mm -hmm. And you're to use that influence to build up the marriage relationship, Right. Well, again, in the same way that wives are told to submit to their husbands, husbands are told already that they should love their wives sacrificially, quote, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands have this sacrifice role, wives have this submission role, and together they reflect the image of God. Anyway, if you... So, so we, have, we have transitioned here from our true Christianity and the idea of submission in general to the the fact that you're talking point number two, that marriage is a complementary relationship. Yes. So that um, one, the, the, the man is incomplete without the woman and the woman without the man yes. in this picture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you go to the next page of our notes here, I did want to highlight that these complementary roles are no justification for abuse mm -hmm. or loss of Christian identity. It might be the proclivity of man to over be overbearing and try to flex that you know leadership role, or it might be the proclivity of the woman to say, "Hey, I don't have to think. I don't have to do anything anymore. I'm just whatever he says. I go with it." And you lose your own identity. Mm -hmm. And both of those extremes are shunned, right? Uh, well, I was thinking when we were reading through this that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Speaking of Christ in the church, with the what. You know, a, a guy could come away from that and say, yeah, it's my job to straighten her out. Mm, and it's like, mercy. that's not the point that's being made there. That's not at all the but, point that's being made. So well, as you said, there's, there, 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 um, there's potential misunderstanding here. So the not, quarterly, no justification for abuse or loss of individuals. Absolutely. In fact, why don't we read what the quarterly says from Sunday, paragraph Sure. Four. It says, the husband is the head of the wife with the church's faithfulness to Christ serving as a model for the wife's loyalty to her husband, the passage presumes a loving, caring marriage and not a dysfunctional one. This verse should not be interpreted to allow any form of domestic abuse. And we can say, of course, a loud amen to that, mm -hmm. that, that, that there's no sanction in Scripture for an abuse. Yeah, Christ did not abuse the church. Absolutely. In fact, how did he, he gave That's himself exactly. for and built her up, right? And I found, this is a, a rather obscure note here, but it's from a testimony. It's called Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adult and Divorce. Adultery, adultery and divorce, and divorce page mm -hmm. 26. But listen to this. Neither the husband nor the wife should merge his or her individuality in that of the other. So I know, mm -hmm. why do you think about what she's saying? That the husband shouldn't just take on the persona of this, absorb the whole family right. into himself. And neither should the wife just defer so much. They're, they're together, they're one, but just like the Godhead, still distinct persons, Right. Again, neither the husband nor the wife should merge his or her individuality in that of the other. Each has a personal relation to God. Of him, each is to ask, what is right? What is wrong? How may I best fulfill life's purpose? Let the wealth of your affection flow forth to him who gave his life for you. Make Christ first and last and best in everything. And as your love for him becomes deeper and stronger, your love for each other will be purified and strengthen. Mm. So I love the priority, the practicality of it. You are going to be one, but your best harmony is going to be when you both focus on Christ to become more like him, then that marriage will reflect that image most perfectly. Absolutely. And speaking of marriage reflecting something, in the few minutes we have remaining, we want to revisit that golden thread that goes through this council, that marriage represents Christ and his church. Over and over, this repeated metaphor, just as Christ loved the church, as Christ mm -hmm. did this for the church. Well, uh, the, it, Yeah, it's interesting that the passage, you go all the way through the passage, and then Paul says, oh, by the way, in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church, not you and your wife. Right. And so, there's, you know, so <laughs> as much as there is the counsel that applies to him and the wife, that's the greater picture. That, that, and I think that's the point, too, is that I've, it's almost like Paul 
is having this this talk about the new man we've already discussed, right? Mm-hmm. And your relationship with Christ and how he cares for his church. And it's almost, the husband and wife part seems to be almost an aside. He's like, hey, while we're here, this is a great application mm-hmm. for husbands and wives. But the bigger picture he's coming back to is I'm talking about Christ and the church. So his bigger takeaway is the primacy of Christ in relation to the church, not specifically uh even though it's practical counsel for husband and wife, it's not a marriage handbook here. Well, it makes me think about what Jesus said to Nicodemus when he said, if I tell you earthly things and you don't understand, how will you understand heavenly things? Mm. In other words, the Lord uses things that we can relate to. Yes. And if we're trying to understand God and the Godhead and how God works in, in relation to the church, He can he's taking a practical earthly example here. Yes that his readers can draw from. You've experienced this, this should help you understand this. Exactly right. So it's a metaphor, it's, it's a parable, if you will. So what uh, Corley puts it this way in Monday, paragraph one, as Paul in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 and 29, shapes his wedding marriage metaphor for the church and its relationship with Christ, he draws creatively on the customs and roles of an ancient wedding. Mm-hmm. Now, there were two days devoted to this, both Monday and Tuesday of the lesson about these wedding roles and the ancient customs and how Paul is drawing from those. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not taking anything away from that scholarship. It's probably all very, very true. But the lesson then takes point, six points, how specific details of ancient customs that were reflected in this council. And I wouldn't necessarily see that if I were just opening the scripture with the unlearned eye or something like this. And I don't know that it's essential to know all six little steps. But the well, I'll actually add to what you're saying, or maybe maybe uh, push back against it a little bit. That my experience with scholars is every scholar has a viewpoint that isn't necessarily like here. This guy's saying like this is what a wedding looked like in Paul's day. I could read five other scholars that gave me five different descriptions on a wedding in Paul's day. Sure. How do I know which one Paul was dealing with? And so. I think what you're getting to is it's better to build our argument from Scripture yeah. than to go to find some historical thing and then superimpose and try to build the argument from some historical case that may not even be completely right. accurate. We know the Bible's accurate. Let's draw from there. Right. And I don't want to get to the point like, oh, you can only understand this passage if you knew the ancient washing customs right. of the... It's like, okay, that may be true, but the big takeaway from me is... And I think this is what Paul is trying to convey, is that Christ loves his church supremely, yes. just as a husband is supposed to love his bride and give himself for her, right? And Christ, in this council here, we see Christ's initiated relationship with us, first, of course, by creation, by creating us at all, yes. but then by giving himself for our redemption. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, right? And I really want to land on this, that furthermore, not only did Christ offer himself but he then pledges himself to the completion of that task of making us marriage ready, yes. if you will. Like he's going to prepare the bride for the kingdom. Well, time doesn't permit to get into the, prof- the prophetic application, but there's a lot in prophecy drawing from this. The idea is, and he called, Paul quotes it right here, the two become one flesh. Mm-hmm. And Ellen White has statements where she says that that references the union of divinity and humanity. Mm. I mean, the gospel is that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. The idea of that union, and there's, you know, so she says the, 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 the wedding supper and the wedding garment was pointing to that union of divinity and mm. humanity. And so just that gospel imagery is is drawn from the wedding as well. It's beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. And I put in the notes here that furthermore, through the washing of water by the word, Christ pledges to present, and I put it in brackets, us, because we are that church, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and blameless. That, that the intent of Christ is not merely to just <laughs> pick up a wife from any rent. He's, he right. wants to prepare this person and make it ready so that the relationship will go the distance. It will last yes. through eternity so that we are, you know, as we would say, fit for heaven. And that he is the one who takes responsibility for doing that. That he's the one who washes through the word, the water, regeneration, and presents us without spot. Mm. Or, this reminds me of Jude 24. Yep. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That 
And of course, Revelation 14 depicts the 144,000 standing right. there with their father's name on the forehead. They've got their beautiful uh, garments. They follow mm -hmm. the lamb wherever they go. They're virgin, undefiled. They're, they're, yes. they're the bride, right? right? In a corporate sense. And this is, an, is a deeply evocative picture of the relation that Christ has to his people, the longing with which he wants to be united with us mm -hmm. for eternity, like a marriage is Absolutely. forever. Mm -hmm. And you see it in Isaiah 62, verse 5. You see it in Revelation 19, 6 through 8. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus, I want you to read Desire of Ages 151 there, because Jesus was standing at that wedding of Cana, and as he sees people getting married to one yes. another for this earthly, he's thinking big picture. Mm. What's it say? In both the Old and New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and his people. To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when he shall bring home his bride to the Father's house, and the redeemed with the Redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So when everybody else is watching an earthly mm. wedding, he's thinking, that's mm. great and all, but there's a much better one yes. to come. And his mind is going there. So I, I think there's a powerful thing. And, and I, I put a little statement from Adventist Home, page 26, in the conclusion. It wasn't found on Friday's lesson, but I thought it would fit so nicely. It says, Christ honored the marriage relation by making it also a symbol of the union between him and his redeemed ones. He himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church of which, as his chosen one, he says... Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Mm. And that's from Song of Solomon 4, awesome. verse 7. The idea that Christ loves us, he's going to make us a worthy bride and take us to his father's house. What a beautiful image. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. <sighs> Time is up. Can you give us a word of closing prayer? Yes, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the testimony of your word. There's so much that um, material in this week's lesson but Lord, I pray that above all, we will understand this relation that you have um, used to communicate your love for us as a husband to his bride, the union that will one day result in us being together as a people with their God for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Our prayer is that everyone within the sound of this recording would be at that marriage supper. Mm. For we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. 